thank you very much for this introduction. I'm super excited. This is the first time at um, ODSC for me or at o ODSC webinar. So welcome everyone to this session. Good afternoon if you are in my time zone. Um, hopefully I can meet some of you in, in person next year at some ODSC conference and we don't, we're not limited to this uh, webinar only. Now, I brought you a whole lot of examples and hands-on live demos. So this, this session is kind of packed and that's probably also why I'll be super focused and I will try to answer all your questions at the end. So don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Uh, I will try and answer them at the end. Now, quickly about me, um, I work as a developer advocate for Databricks. Developer advocacy means I spend a lot of time in you know, creating and preparing technical content for a wider audience. And that wider audience is um, you today. Um, Databricks is a data and AI company. It was um, founded by the original creators of Apache Spark and MLflow but also uh, other open source tools such as Koala or Delta IO or the brand new Delta sharing that I will be um, talking about today. So myself, I spent some time in brain research, high performance computing. I wrote a couple of books about cloud computing, about middleware, about enterprise Java, run my own boutique consultancy for a while and then joined AWS, joined uh, Databricks right now and I super enjoy it, we are hiring. <laughs> All right, I have like three examples of sharing huge amounts of data. And the first one, I assume you're almost, you don't wanna see this anymore because we've been looking at this kind of data for so long now, for 18 months. Um, but it's a good question, isn't it? Like how would you share this kind of data to a wider audience? Maybe to a geeky audience like, like yourself or like myself, like people that want to get the raw data and then well, plot the data, work with the data, and well, do just more with the data. So that's the first example that I have for you, like publicly available health or scientific data. Then something happened like uh, three, maybe four years ago in my life, I met an oncologist, but don't worry, nobody was sick, I wasn't sick. Um, I met this person to speak about data actually to speak about a lot of data because this oncologist, he acquired like almost three petabyte of data. Now he's one of the top leading oncologists for leukemia, um, for children suffering from blood cancer. And the way his work changed, he told me was that like 30 years ago, he had very few medications to treat those people or to treat those children. And all he could, could do is like see blood cells in his microscope. Now today he's still looking through the same microscope and looking at those blood cells, but he has the complete source code of every patient. He has the DNA, DNA, and he samples the DNA for every single patient. And he has patients where they have a subtype of leukemia that he has seen like 700 times. And he has copies of those DNAs. And obviously it's an interesting question of what do they have in common, what is different. And then he told me that he has seen a subtype of leukemia like once in his whole life. And again, he has a copy of the DNA. He has a copy of the source code of this patient. Now, this guy was walking me through his lab and what you see here is actually one of those DNA sequences. Uh, it's the size of a washing machine. And one of these machines um, is able to sequence the DNA of uh, I think 16 or 18 different patients together. So they all throw this together in one test tube, he told me. and <clears throat> I said, how do you keep it apart then? And he said, well, we write a unique identifier at the beginning of the DNA. So I think when I was submitting this uh, this webcast, I said, you know, we're going to look at some DNA, but it's all read only, so there's no harm done to the presenter. That was kind of joke. But this person, he's literally able to modify the DNA and create some kind of UUID and attach it to the DNA. And then he has all kind of small cut samples within one test tube. And because of the ID, he's able to relate what part of DNA belongs to which um, patient. Now, imagine you have this huge data set, and this is how the, 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 the visit with this uh, oncologist ended. He told me that he's going to retire soon. And he doesn't really know what to do with his institute. And he's employing like 200 people 
he has these uh, sequences where one box costs like uh, one million, and he has twelve of them in a row. So it's more like a you know like a like a factory than like a small lab. And he invested a whole lot of money. Like, would you make this a public data source? And it's I think it's a question we can't answer here because you know there's all his personal money involved, and there is like a lot of philosophy involved. Like, what would you do with all these assets? But a, a good technical question is if you wanted to share this data, and he's also having like a dozen of PhD and uh, math master uh, students at a at a given point of time, and he's sharing some data with uh, you know befriended institutes, um, how would you do that technically? And that's one of the things I want to answer in this presentation. And then last but not least. I think sometimes it's rather easy, you know, to put data somewhere to make it shareable. But what we are really interested in is live data, data that changes in a transactional way, and we still want to be able to share it. Now, thinking about this oncologist, what would you suggest to him? Well, first of all, very often we have like systems that come from a particular vendor where the vendor tells you, you know, you can share data to a new instance. Obviously, you need to get this new instance, you need to license it, and you need to pay for this new instance. And this is what you see on the on the left hand side on the first um, column. So it's not cheap. It's not multi cloud. Um, it's not open source. It's actually not open at all. So probably that's not a very appealing solution. Then sometimes at the beginning, when I when I did this uh, talk, people said, "Why wouldn't you just put it on an FTP server?" Seems a little bit outdated these days. Maybe you you have some discussions with your security team if you do that. But it is open source. It is multi cloud because it's a very low level. There's no problem why you shouldn't be able to FTP from Azure or GCP or AWS. Um, but what you don't have is a higher level of ab abstraction. You know, sometimes we have data. We have data that is kind of represented as tables. But at the end, it, it goes down to a couple of hundreds or thousands of or tens of thousands of CSV or JSON files. And this is what you wouldn't get with the FTP. And also, it's not really scalable. So scaling FTP to a you know, to a cloud scale, something that you would expect from a digital native company that becomes very popular is, is not an easy task. Now, sometimes people say, how about S3? If I put something in a S3 bucket, I get a S3 URL. And I think that's a pretty attractive approach. It's kind of limited to S3 only. So you probably want to have some higher level abstraction that would also work for GCS and ADLS uh, too. Um, it is cool because you have an unlimited amount of storage. You have high availability. You have durability. You get the bandwidth that you get from S3 that is pretty good. And you pay for zero compute, which is actually cool because you know S3 is storage only and you don't need to run a cluster um, to access S3. Now, if you look at those options like uh, vendor-specific FTP S3 URLs and you try to merge them or put them together, you almost get what Delta Sharing is doing. So Delta Sharing is ticking all the boxes. It is open source. It is at GitHub. It's a Linux Foundation open source project. It uses an open format that is uh, well described on GitHub. It's vendor independent. It is multi-cloud per definition. Um, actually, I just had a discussion with AWS. I'm uh, writing an article for AWS, and they told me, well, you try to market this as multi-cloud. I said, yeah, actually, we, we don't need to market this as multi-cloud because it's such a, it, the, the level is low enough to be, you know, to, to be useful and to work on every cloud, but it's still high enough that it gives you this abstraction for tables. And that's what I'm trying to show you. It uses the cloud object store, so you get the object store bandwidth on whatever cloud you are. And at the end, you can use Pandas or Apache Spark to access the data. That's also something I want to show you. And you could also use a commercial BI client, um, such as uh, you know Power BI or Tableau. You can host it yourself if you like. You can use a hosted um, cloud service. Um, all these options are possible. Now, very often, if we talk about huge amounts of data, this data ends up in a lake house. 
Now, some of you might be familiar with the term, maybe some of you are not. To put it simply, the lake house is the combination, the best of both worlds from the data warehouse on the one hand side and a data lake on the other side. So the data warehouse is working really well if you want to look backwards, if you want to have a BI tool generating your reports, if you want to have a report about you know, how many ice creams did you sell last month and what you still have available in the stock in milk and sugar and vanilla to create more ice creams. And the, the data lake is more suitable if you want to do machine learning. So if you start with machine learning, you're probably not starting with a data warehouse. And I actually just had an, an interview with uh, the author of the book from uh, data science at AWS. And I said, when did you last time use a data warehouse to start with machine learning? And she told me that sometimes she has data that is on a data warehouse, and then she's exporting it and putting it into S S3 bucket, and then you know use SageMaker or MLflow to um, to run machine learning on this data. And that's actually something that we want to avoid, like creating another copy, another silo of the data. And this is why um, Databricks also kind of championed the lake house and the lake house. As I said, it's the best of both worlds. You get efficient SQL access. It's ideal for ML. And it is a lake first approach. So your data stays on S3. It's just a very thin layer on top of it that gives you this additional quality of service. Um, it's open source. Again, it's a Linux foundation. You can look at the code anytime. It's well integrated with Spark. All you would do is say, you know, Spark data frame, say format Delta instead of say format, well, CSV or JSON or Parquet or whatever. So you can't think about this as a managed Parquet file. And um, this is what gets us to Delta sharing. Now, Delta sharing, there is a sharing server. That's what you see in the middle of this slide. And this sharing server, well, you can host it if you like. Uh, there is a pre-built sharing server that you just download from GitHub. Um, there's also a Docker image that you could get from Docker Hub. So you either run Docker run and then specify the image that you want to run as a container, or you get this pre-built server, you unpack it. And that's actually the version that I want to demo you um, in, in one of the demos. Um, if you don't want to do this, there is other options. There is a hosted reference slash example server that you could just access, and that will be the very first demo that I want to show you. Um, and what we do is we share those lake house tables, the Delta Lake tables, which again, are just uh, managed um, Parquet files. Um, because it's a lake house, you get this transactional behavior. You get an understanding about, you know, what can happen in parallel about concurrency that your data access is um, serializable. All this is this additional um, quality of service. You can update objects. That's very important. Um, and as I said, it it stays with this lake first approach. And the backend could be any cloud. At the moment, it is S3. We just uh, got the source code um, for ADLS2. And we're waiting for more contributions. And I hope that it will be GCS um, as soon as possible. And um, so in the first example that I'm trying to show you, we want to concentrate on the front end, on the client side. And now you're maybe saying like, hang on, you're just uh, trying to avoid the most difficult part, the server part. But what I'm doing is I'm using a client. Um, the idea is to show you that building such a client is um, relatively easy. Probably should say this at the end of the demo if the demo worked now, but um, let me say building a client is, is relatively easy. You can judge yourself after um, the demo. Um, the very first demo will actually be cross vendor multi cloud. Now, you know, there's a lot of people out there that will tell you that multi cloud is nonsense and multi cloud is just what you do at the beginning. If you, if you, you know, if you don't trust your own cloud and you want to replicate everything, I don't think this is necessarily true because data per se very often is multi cloud. Some things get generated or collected in one cloud. Some data ends up in another cloud. And with your tools, you do want to have this option of, you know, just running them everywhere. Um, so the very first demo, hopefully, will show you that it, it works cross-vendor and multi-cloud. It will also show you that the clients are easy to build. 
And I think it should show you that we work on this abstraction level of data frames and, and tables and, and not files. Right, so with this, I'm trying to change the screen sharing. Let me give me a second, right? All right, I think you should see my new the, the shared browser. It just says paused. I think now it should work. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to, let me resize that a little bit. What I want to do is, turn this off, whatever that is. What I want to do is, <laughs> starting a third time, um, using a client on Google Cloud, actually using Google Colab, which is one of the hosted notebooks that they have, and make it talk to the backend. And the backend is this example server, the reference implementation that we have running at Databricks. So it's the, the, the most simple case that you could probably have, and it's just a focus on the client side. And don't bother, we will see the server side in the next example. Now to access the notebook, I actually prepared it uh, let's see if this is still working. I go to Google, Google Colab, which uh, is sharing the notebook um, in my Google Drive. I could share it here with you. I could actually, it is also on uh, GitHub. So if you go to GitHub F Muns, you can just access the same notebook. This notebook, and that's the super cool thing, runs as is. So you don't need to change anything and it should work. Um, let's try that. First step to get this working, I need to install the Delta sharing libraries. Let me run this again. It was running before. It says requirement already satisfied because I was running this before and that's cool. So I have the libraries. I need to import them and this is what I'm, what I'm doing here. So I say import Delta sharing and let's maybe zoom in even a little bit more. Let me run this and uh, what happens is I import a library. I need to construct a profile file. Now this profile file is um, basically a file that contains all the details we need to talk to the Delta sharing server. Now the Delta sharing server is now running at Databricks and it's, a, it's like a fixed example. And this is why we can also use the example from GitHub to get the file and actually the file if I run this again, the file looks like this. So it has a version. It has an endpoint, which is pointing to delta.io, to sharing.delta.io. That's the document root. And it, it contains a bearer token. So it uses basic authentication. It requires the bearer token. If I don't come with a bearer token, I could not talk to the endpoint. And Using this file, using this profile that I get here from GitHub, I can create a sharing client. So I say sharing client, use the profile file, and that's my client. And then with the client, I say list all tables. Now list all tables returns this, and it re returns some COVID data, it returns Boston housing. And if I scroll more, there's the typical public data sets um, that we are hosting for you well, for you to try your clients. So I was running this, you've seen that file. And now what I do is I want to access the data as a table. So I use the profile file and then I uh, specify the share. I say Delta sharing, that's the name of the share. Then the second one in this namespace, it is sometimes called schema and sometimes called database. Um, and it uses the default um, database or the default um, schema. And then this is the name of the table. That's actually one of the tables that was shown um, um, on the top. And then I say with this table URL, Delta sharing load as pandas from this table URL. I could say load as Spark and it would give me a Spark data frame, 
but I want a pandas data frame. And um, this is what just happened. So if I run the next command, and it's a typical um, spiel and syntax that you know much better using pandas, if I want to restrict the data to the ISO code for Australia, and then say, well, give me zero to three, first three lines, I'll get this. And then that's a plot. I was running this before, but I run it for you again. That's the COVID data, total cases in Australia starting from 26th of January 2020 until March in uh, 2021. Now, obviously, this total cases plot um, always goes up. But let's look what we have. We have new cases. Let me change. I let me change this to new cases, shift return, e voila. This looks pretty much like one of those COVID curves that we don't want to see anymore. Um, it shows you how quickly we can access the data and then do all the manipulations that you used with, um, with pandas. It also shows you, you know, from the code that I needed, it's basically the profile file constructing um, uh, constructing this namespace, which is um, returned um, here. It gives me the share and it gives me the schema and it gives me the table name. And then I, all I do is Delta sharing load as pandas. Um, so Matei, our CTO, demoed this on the Data and AI Summit. And I think it took him like three or four lines um, as well to run this on Amazon EMR. You could uh, run it the same way on SageMaker. This is um, Google Delta, uh, Google um, Colab. Um, and obviously, you don't need any of these uh, managed notebooks. It could be pure um, open source as well. With this, let me quickly change back to, to screen two, which brings us here. Oops, sorry. Right, um, so lessons learned, it's easy to create a client. Um, even the very first client um, was using um, cross-vendor and multi-cloud. And we work on this abstraction level um, that is a data frame, a Pandas data frame, excuse me, hit the microphone, uh, a Pandas data frame or a Spark data frame. Now, demo number two um, is regarding the DNA data from this oncology professor. Now, I think it wouldn't be suitable to have the data from a real patient. Um, actually, the professor, I think he's still working, so he didn't retire yet and didn't uh, make his data set um, public uh, when I checked um, last time. But I didn't hesitate to spend any amount of money to give you a very similar example. So without joking, what I did is I uh, went and got my own DNA analyzed. I spit into test tube. You pay like $150 and you get um, the data for your DNA. And it looks like this. It's a raw file. It's a TSV file. Uh, and um, so you can load it as a, as a TSV, as a CSV file with, um, with Spark in, in one line. And then you can say, you know, data frame, um, write, format, delta. And then you have it in the delta format. You have it in your lake house. And you can share it. And you can use the same kind of client and explore it. And this is what I want to do and what I want to um, what I want to um, explain you in a little bit more detail. And um, so the whole scenario looks a little bit more complicated. So what I have again is the data sharing server. And the data sharing server is using a config YAML file. Now this config YAML file is uh, containing a, a, a line that you will see that kind of maps the share schema table to the underlying S3 bucket. And um, I'm also using an EC2 instance role um, that allows the data sharing server to talk to S3. And then under the hood from the client to the sharing server, it's using a REST protocol. That's the open protocol that is well documented. Oops. That's the open document uh, docu protocol that is well documented. 
And um, this is also the kind of protocol that other systems could use, you know, like uh, commercial tools that want to integrate with um, the, the Delta sharing server and um, implement a pro protocol to access the data. On the client side, what you see here, there's a file which is called profile share. And this profile share file in the first demo was the one that I got from GitHub, actually because I didn't have to change it. Usually it's a file that you have on the client side. It contains the endpoint of the server side. It contains the bearer token. So you can write it with uh, VI if you like, you know. Um, there's other ways to, to generate it that I will show you um, at the very end of, of, of this session. Um, so it's the profile share file on the client side and it's the config YAML on the server side. And these are the components that you need to understand. And there's actually one more thing that is, I think, incredibly cool. If you are here on the client side and you want to retrieve some data, what you get back is a short-lived pre-signed S3 URL. That means you're not getting back the data immediately. You get back the S3 URL. Now, with this URL, you do what? Well, you go to S3 and, well, the client does that for you. You retrieve the data from S3 at the bandwidth of F3. And isn't that amazing? Um, because you could do that uh, also in parallel and you can kind of use the whole bandwidth of F3 to retrieve your data, um, which also means the Delta sharing server is not the bottleneck. It doesn't become the bottleneck. It doesn't it, It's not that the data is going through the Delta sharing server, but the client is using these, well, abstracted, pre-signed, cloud object store URLs to get the data in a very, very efficient way. Uh, and that's also why Delta Sharing Server is working for huge amounts of data. It's scaling well. And um, this is something that I'm trying to show you in the following demo. So give me a second to switch back to... Um, good question. Give me a second to switch back to two things. Um, first of all, to the browser here. Right, so we ended here. Um, what I wanted to show you is that you can simply go to Delta IO. Um, that's the site for the lake house. You could start with your open source lake house if you wanted, but that's not the, the focus of this talk. You go to sharing and then you go to releases. And if you go to releases, you end up here 0.2.0. .0. You can get the official Docker image that you get anyway if you run Docker run, or you could just download the server and unpack it. And that's what I've done in the next demo. So for the next demo, I have my data already on S3. Remember I told you it's the lake first approach. Your data just stays where it is. So let me see if me as being an ex AWS employee is still able to get here to S3. This is working. And here we go. That's my bucket. It's in Frankfurt EU Central One. It's called Delta FM 2805, which is this um, unique ID that happens to be my birthday if you want to send some presents. And that's the um, that's the folders or that's the um, objects that I have. And one of them is my genomic data that is here. And another one is a full example genome data set from actually from a public data set that I got from the internet. Remember when I told you about the lake house and I told you it's like a managed parquet file. This is the parquet file. And this is where all the management happens in that gives you this you know, um, transactional safety and um, serializability and whatever that I don't want to focus on today. At the end, it's just parquet and you could read it anyhow um, if you want it. So that's the backend, that's the S3. Now I'm running a server and I'm running the server um, on uh, EC2 and that's why I share to my iTerm and that's my iTerm. Um, what I'm doing is, um, first of all, I want to start the Delta sharing server here and that's actually the line to start it. Basically what I say is start the server 
with this config YAML file. And the config YAML file looks like this. Remember, I promised you there is a mapping from shares. And now you see that I'm not very creative. So the name of the share is share one. Then there is a schema. The name of the schema is default. And then we have the tables. Remember the S3 buckets that I was showing you? There is cars, there is one with a name genome K full, and then there's one with a slightly restricted one for my genome that is under Delta FM 2805 genome frame. Um, so that's the S3 location. And if you go backwards from name to schema to scare, you get this logical name that was this triple namespace that I used in the first client to access the data. Remember also that, uh, that uh, the, um, the share file had the bearer token. This is on the server side where I would define the bearer token. Now, this is commented out. I was using one, two, three, four, and then I realized, well, I could just uh, drop it. And just to play around, I decided not to use any bearer token. But this is where you could specify this lengthy bearer token to use um, basic authentication. This is where I specify the endpoint of the server. Now, this one is listening to localhost four times nine, and it has the endpoint Delta sharing server. And you could configure more like um, caching and like how long these pre-signed URLs should be valid, et cetera. But that's not really um, important here. Um, what I want to do is, um, this is how to start a Delta sharing server. Let me try and execute that line. This looks good. So that's the sharing server starting up. And remember that sharing server is um, listening to localhost. Um, actually, this demo will use open source only. So very often I get asked, so how much Databricks is involved in this? Um, well, we initially built that project and gave it to the Linux Foundation. But for this demo that is showing you a whole lot of things, there's nothing, no Databricks product involved. So it's using EC2. It's using the, uh, the Delta sharing server that you can just download. That's what I did already. So I downloaded it. I unpacked it. It comes with a demo config YAML file. That's the, the file that I used to create my own. And the, the file that I created myself, I just showed you. And then I start up the server. And all this is, uh, is uh, well documented in the official Delta sharing server configuration. Now, this one here, um, this tab is opening a tunnel. Um, and actually, I wanted to have a tunnel that goes from my local browser that is running on my Mac back to the EC2 instance, so I could just access it with uh, localhost. Um, right. And now I still need to run the notebook server, and that's the third tab. So from the third tab, I'm running the notebook server, which is basically um, Jupyter. So I want to run it as PySpark. I want to add the Delta packages. Um, so it's able, the Jupyter notebook is able to understand the Delta format. And then it's all this, uh, this whole uh, number of lines. But what you see here at the end, specifying the AWS success key, that's what I initially put to try something, but that's not what you should do, obviously. So you don't want to have your access keys hard-coded here. You don't even want to have them in a environment variable. So I'm not using them. Look at this. Uh, yep. And it is hopefully starting up and working. And you already know the reason why this should be working, because I configured a IAM instance role that is attached to this EC2 instance, and that allows the EC2 instance to talk to S3, which is the much better way of doing this. I um, blocked about this. So if you want to see how this is going, um, there is a block out there. If you Google for it with my name, you will find it. What you see here is the URL of my Jupyter notebook, which again uses a bearer token, which I never configured. That's just what um, Jupyter does. So I go back to my browser and share the browser window again, which is, is that the right one? Ah, that's the right one. Here we go. I'll 
paste the URL. Here we go. I speak to Jupyter from my local Mac going through the tunnel. Don't worry about the tunnel. I click on the notebook that I want to run. There is one under DNA, and it's actually, I think, this one that I wanted to run. Remember, I had my raw um, DNA file stored in the lake house under S3, in an S3 bucket. Now, what comes here is boring to you because you're experts in this already. I install data sharing libraries. I'll look at this file again just to make sure it's going to localhost, but don't be fooled. This localhost is kind of going through the tunnel to the other side, to the EC2 instance, and um, happily talking to Delta Sharing. Then I import Delta Sharing. I have the profile file, which is local now, which is the more common thing. So don't be confused about the first one um, coming from GitHub. That was just because I used that pre canned um, server at uh, Databricks. Now I have my own server running. I have my own share file, and this share file uh, on the client side is pointing um, to the server. This was running um, already, and it returns the available tables. Remember, I had cars. Remember, I had this genome K full, and remember, I had this um, genome Frank. Now, I want to load my genome, and now things get really exciting because this is my source code. That's why I was joking. I'm uh, sharing my source code. So that's my source code shared that I access uh, through the tunnel using Pandas data frames. Now, if I say genome, I get all this. So it's like 638,000 lines in my genome. And the genome, every um, RSID here, which is a location in the genome, has a genotype, which is this AA or AG. Now, those A's and G's and T's, there are bases. It's called base or base pairs. So it's a two of them together, AA and AG. And this would be a way, the pandas way to, well, to get one of the genotypes. Here I was playing a little bit. I looked at the genome and I said, give me a histogram over the genotype. So it could be AA or TT, whatever I told you. And there is that many of these genotypes. And you see there's a few, which are uh, many less, but that's actually not really important. That was just me exploring um, a genomic data set. Um, a histogram over the chromosome, um, which is another column in the raw data tells you that it starts with one to three and it goes to 22 and then there is X and Y. So there's 23 chromosome pairs as you might remember from biology. And that's that little helper function that I want to use to really access my genome. Now, if you go to one RSID like this one, it's a location in the genome and the, um, the encoding like the genotype um, defines the, the trait. And this number, like 12913832, is encoding the color of my eyes. Now, this G, the very first G, to get this right, the first one is coming from my mom, and the other one is coming from my dad. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. And both two together, they have a meaning. That's the trait, not a genetic trait. And you all know Wikipedia, and there is something which is called SNPedia. And SNPedia is like Wikipedia just for genomic data. And you can look up those uh, SNPs. They're called SNPs or RSIDs. And the SNP, the SNP, the genotype, AA means that, AG means that, and GG, that's actually me. It means blue eye color 99% of the time. Now, I don't know if you see this through the webcam, but I have blue eyes. So this is kind of really working and it's uh, matching my DNA. And let's have a bit more fun. I used to have a personal trainer. Um, hey, Johnny. And he once said, did you ever check your coffee metabolism? And I said, how could I check my coffee metabolism, please? And he said, there is a as a, a snippet, an RSID, and if you know your genotype for this snippet, which is AA, now we know, now the whole world knows my genotype uh, for this um, snippet, it's AA, and AA actually means there is no increased coffee metabolism. So I am, I just put the cup away, I wanted to show you here, but it's uh, just like two meters away. 
can't show you in the webcam now. Um, so I'm drinking a lot of coffee. I just had a coffee before I started this webcast, but there is no genomic reason for me for drinking that much coffee. That's something we should not forget. You know, there's many other reasons than your genome. Um, there was a study done with 8,000 people um, drinking coffee, and they understood that uh, the coffee consumption is correlated to this snippet. And if you have a AT or a TT genotype, it's associated with an increased coffee consumption because you have a higher coffee metabolism, you, your body breaks down the coffee more quickly, and this is why you tend to drink more coffee. Now the next one, this is pure fun. Um, it's AG, it's called, I can't even pronounce it, Voria, and uh, Voria versus uh, Voria. Um, it's two, like Vori and uh, Voria. Um, and I'm in the middle. Um, it basically goes back to um, to the dopamine levels that you have. Being in the middle is quite good um, because you could be one extreme, somebody who is worried about many things, or you could you could be like this fighter type of person. But it comes with a higher pain threshold, which sounds um, desirable. Um, better stress resiliency, albeit with a modest reduction in executive cognition. Um, you cannot choose, you can't choose your parents, you can't choose your uh, genotype, but I wouldn't like to have this modest reduction in executive cognition. So I'm happy to be in the middle here, the boring um, person. There is something called photonic sneeze reflex um, that determines if there is a genetic um, disposition to, well, to have to sneeze if you look into light. I think I don't have this either. I'm CT, which is probably in the middle. So I have this a little bit. I never realized that I have this. Anyway, that's a lot of fun that we can have looking at my DNA that is shared via Delta sharing server. And I told you that that's the fun, entertaining example. Um, but it all goes back to this discussion that I had with the um, oncology professor that said, Do you know, should I share this as a public data set to the whole world? And could I share this to another institute? How would I share this with my students? And um, obviously, you can always share files, but that's not what data scientists and machine learning people want to use. They want to have this pandas or um, Spark data frame um, abstraction. Right, let's go back to the slides just for a quick second. Which are here. All right. And there we go. We talked about this, about the more detailed view of, you know, having the file on the client side that talk, tells you how to talk to the server side and having the file on the server side that basically specifies the endpoint the server is listening to and also specifies the mapping to the S3 bucket. And I think you've seen all of this. So you're real experts with this. I walked you through my genome and there was the GG that encodes the color of my eyes. I was really happy that this is uh, working and this is matching. Um, it's not always like this and that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, that's the config file. Let's just skip this. Actually, what I wanted to tell you is that you should not do this at home. It could backfire. Uh, probably you've seen it in the news that there were some people even doing surgery because they had a certain genomic disposition. And I think you should not do that. Certainly not do that. You should um, don't try to copy what I did. That's the short version. Um, if you have any questions, talk to your doctor, to your medical doctor, not to somebody like me who has a PhD in uh, computer science, um, it could go wrong and you could end up, you know, having some, getting some details that you don't want to know. Um, that's the very short version. That's the graphical disclaimer. I think you all understand what I mean. And actually, to be honest, it took me like uh, two or three years to finally decide to do that. Um, and nothing bad uh, came came out of this. Anyway, Right, so what we learned is that data sharing environment can be open source only. Remember, I mean, no need to argue now that EC2 is not really open source, um, but it could be on your laptop, it could be on your server that is uh, sitting under your desk. It's PySpark, it's Jupyter, 
It's a data sharing server. It could be the image coming from Docker Hub. Uh, you can run it anywhere. Remember, it's the lake first approach. Your data stays on the lake house. Now that brings me already to the very last demo that I want to quickly show you. And this is the kind of question, and that's a very interesting question, I think. Do you really want to run all these open source tools? Now, when I demoed this, I always feel a bit excited. And I thought like, oh, there's so many things that could go wrong. Now I did this like twice or three times and I feel more confident. But if I was the responsible person for running that server on an enterprise level for a big company, I would probably want to have much more experience and you probably want to have better security. You want to front end this with the engine X and you, you want to do much more and you want to be in control of everything and you need to monitor this and you need to patch it and you need to update it. And you probably need a small operations team that really makes sure that your, you know, the shared genomic data for all this scientific data um, is available even on Christmas Eve and so on. And I was doing a similar job. I was running uh, middleware operations for BMW for two years. And at the end, we've been a team of 12 or 14 people all, you know, installing, configuring and patching and monitoring web service and application service and databases and, you know, the whole shebang. And um, that's actually the, the, the thing that the cloud gives you today. Um, so one option could be, and I think that's a very interesting option, also interesting from a architectural um, perspective, is that you could just use the same thing from a managed notebook. And that is the last demo that I want to quickly show you. I'm going back, hang on just a second. Yep, that looks good. Um, almost good. Getting there. Right. So I'm sharing my um, my Chrome again, and I have a notebook prepared for you. It's uh, running on 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 Databricks, and let me just try. Um, that's the one I wanted to sh I wanted to show you. Let's get rid of this. It's actually attached to a cluster, so I can I can run it. Um, so in this notebook, I have a hosted cloud service that I can just use. So all this, you know, installing the server, configuring it, and patching it goes away. It kind of almost becomes serverless because you don't see this Delta sharing server um, anymore. And it's all replaced by plain, simple SQL commands. So that's that's the amazing part of it. So what I do is I say, that's the quick intro. I say, use a catalog, uh, which is the catalog main. And then I say, use a database, uh, which is uh, a database that I created already. It's called FrankDB. And then create a table in this database for motorbikes with the make and the year and the model and so on. I insert some data. Um, like beautiful old motorbikes, Yamaha, Honda, Triumph. And don't worry about this, I, uh, I did something else. Um, I can do a select and I would see the three, um, the three uh, motorbikes that I just inserted. Now, the interesting thing is if I want to a share, uh, create a share, I say create share and give it a name. Now I say alter share, the name of the share and add my table that I just created. So with these two SQL lines, I have a share, I have a table, I attach the table to the share, I can see my shares with a show all in uh, share, and then I still need a recipient. Now I can create a recipient, which is create recipient, and then I give it a name. Now this recipient already exists, but I can name it Frank2. If I run this, what I get is a activation link. Now with this activation link, look at this, I download a credential file. Now the credential file here, show in Finder, and there will be a few of them. 
Uh, let's use text edit. That's not the preferred one. I think you can't see this because it's uh, it's not shared, but it's just it's the credential file. Um, let me share this main screen. Um, this is the credential file with the endpoint and the bearer token. And I'm going back to Google Chrome. Hang on to to that one. Anyway, this gives you the um, the share file, um, which is um, used on the client side. And then I use a, a grant select on that share with that name to that recipient. And I allow the recipient um, to talk to that share. Sometimes I demo this and I forget the grant. And then on the recipient side, it's not working. Now you're asking what is the recipient side? And the recipient side, think about back to the very first example. It could, could be Google Colab again. Now, because we're a bit short of time, I'm not showing you this. But what I typically do is I have a Google Colab client um, that you've seen in the first exercise that is accessing the um, motorbike share, actually this share, Frank bikes, and it retrieves the bikes. And then what you see is it, it will see all those three bikes. And then what I do is remember that's a table. It's not some file that I dump on an FTP server that will lie there forever. It's a table. It's a table that I can use for anything. I can actually use it for update um, because it's a Delta Lake table. So I can do updates, I can do merge, although behind the curtains, it's all um, persisted on S3. So I do this update um, and uh, on the client side, let me tell you this first. On the client side, I have a select from that share and I want to retrieve all the motorbikes with the, with the year less than 2000, which should be this one. It's not this one. Uh, and not this one. And then I do an update. I, I change the year and I say set year 1999 for this ID and, and the number of you know rows return um, changes. And if I run the same uh, command on the client side, I would see a different number um, of tables. Um, so what we see here is, first of all, we can abstract away running the server, installing the server, creating a share, creating a recipient, creating the share file the recipient, all with SQL commands. And um, then we can also work with updates on the tables and they will, well, they will work as updates. And then if you update the data set, it will, uh, if you retrieve the data set again on the client side, it will change on the client side as well. Right, so this is what I wanted to show you here. And let me go back to screen two with the slides. All right, that's a screenshot of the notebook. And that's the create recipient of the notebook. All that is in the slides. Um, I think the lessons learned is you can get away from operating this yourself and, and just using a cloud service. That's a typical cloud service uh, story. Um, don't do the heavy lifting yourself unless you think you are into operations um, of these servers. It does work with uh, live data. I haven't showed you the client, uh, but um, because of uh, time restrictions, we're running close to uh, one hour. Um, data sharing, it's actually built into the Databricks um, compute plane. Um, so you can use it from a Databricks account. It is in preview right now. So um, there's a website you can sign up um, to, um, to try that. It is part, technically, it's part of another product, which is called the Unity catalog, which goes back to the, well, the big discussion that we have these days about data meshes. If you talk about a data mesh, you want to do two things. You want to be able to share your data, but you also want to be able to restrict what is shared. So the Unity catalog works on account level, allows you to specify um, not only for tables, but also for rows and columns and for attributes, what you want to share. Um, and then with uh, Delta sharing, you can share your data even across systems, across clouds, across vendors, um, well, across anything um, almost. And that brings us to the conclusion and the final slide. 
Um, it's platform independent, open source way of sharing massive amounts of data. It works with live data. The clients are super easy. It could be Spark or Pandas. It could be a commercial client using um, the open API. Um, I've showed you a couple of notebooks that are working as a client. You can use any, any kind of notebook. We give you a pre-packaged sharing server. Um, you can run it as a Docker container. I didn't show you, um, but that's well documented. At the end, and maybe hopefully this is uh, the this is coming a little bit out of this uh, presentation. What we are trying as Databricks is we want to simplify um, data and AI. Um, so think about this uh, hosted managed um, notebook um, version. I've done an event that kind of summarizes everything we've done at the Data and AI summer Data and AI summit. It's called Slice and Dice. Um, you get these slides. I'm going to share them uh, tomorrow, and then you can click on the event. Um, it's online on YouTube, covering everything from Delta sharing to Delta Live tables to many, many more um, new releases that we did. There is a, a great EMEA community, and we just started a new forum, which you get to on the community.databricks.com. So any technical questions that I won't be able to answer today, just go to the forum, post them in the forum community.databricks.com, and there will be lots of people around um, to answer those questions. We have a new program that is called Beacons Program. Um, it's a bit like uh, AWS Heroes or the, the Microsoft, the Azure MVPs. Um, this is where we try to honor people that do a lot of presentations, that talk about data sharing, data lake, et cetera. Check them out. They're very, very cool people, highly skilled people, great presentation skills. They've done a lot of cool work. Um, they're called the Beacons. Actually, I'm running a lot of meetup groups. So if you are in EMEA, if you like to talk about a technical story, we want technical stories, to be honest. No sales, no marketing, honest tech bits. So if you're somewhere in EMEA, uh, we have meetup groups anywhere from Johannesburg, Cape Town in the south, to Russia, to St. Petersburg, Moscow, to the Nordics. I'm super excited to meet you, to invite you for a presentation. Uh, I think we're going to have in-person presentations early next year. Just ping me. I'm super interested to be in contact with you. And with this, um, well, that's one more slide. Sometimes people say, you all do this command line stuff. Are there any big companies using it? And I say, well, depends on if you think Shell and Ford and McDonald's is a big company. Um, right. These are all my details, technical details to connect, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. I'm not sure if the recording is uh, staying on, but I'll just go to the chat and uh, answer a few questions. The questions that I can't answer, if there's too many questions, please go to the forum community.databricks.com. Thank you for listening. It was such an honor to speak at uh, this webinar um, and hopefully going to meet you at some uh, conference. Thank you. Bye.